Welcome to another podcast from Odell Technology. Today, we're honoured to be joined by Professor Andrew Gums, um, who is in France currently. Hello, Andrew. Hello, Stephen. Nice to see you again. Yeah, nice to see you again too, sir. Andrew, what I'd like to do is start the, the podcast with you introducing yourself, talking about your background and how you ended up in France, if that's okay. Sure, sure. Uh, currently, I'm at uh, the Centre uh, Hospitalier Intercommunal de Poissy and Saint-Germain-en-Laye, uh, which is uh, West Paris, uh, essentially. I live in Paris. I'm originally uh, born in New York. My, my father is British Caribbean from uh, Anguilla. Uh, he actually uh, went to New York University when he was uh, 18. And then for medical school, he went to Bologna, Italy, where he met my mother. Uh, they came back to New York. I was born there. Um, it's, it's kind of easiest just to start from the beginning, uh, as you can see. And when I was three months old, we actually moved to Seoul or Seoul, uh, South Korea during the Vietnam War. My father, because he, was, he wanted to become a naturalized American citizen, uh, joined the army uh, during the Vietnam War. And, and luckily for us, uh, they had pity on uh, my family, I would say a little bit. And we were sent to Seoul, uh, Korea. My father actually worked at the last uh, MASH unit. It was no longer a mobile army hospital at the time. It was a, you know, like a true fixed hospital. But I was there for the first, basically the first year of my life. My first words were actually in Korean. And uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't tell you that part. We, we actually, um, yeah, we had, a, we had a nanny from South Korea uh, when, I was, when I was a kid. So basically, we'll, 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 skip, we'll skip a few years. And uh, I'll just tell you, I went to college at Yale University. I went to medical school at the uh, Yale School of Medicine. I did my surgical residency at Yale New Haven Hospital. Uh, I did a two-year pancreatic surgery fellowship at the University of Verona. Um, then I did a minimally invasive uh, surgery fellowship or a minimal access surgery fellowship at the University Hospitals of Cornell and Columbia in Manhattan, where I got to work with uh, people like uh, Dennis Fowler and Michel Gagné, um, you know, two, two really uh, the fathers of laparoscopic surgery. Um, then, then what did I do? I went to Paris, actually, and I did a minimally invasive hepatic pancreatic and biliary surgery fellowship with uh, a guy called Fabrice Gaillet. Uh, back then, there weren't any places you could learn how to do laparoscopic Whipple procedures, which is removal of the head of the pancreas, really considered one of the most complex uh, surgeries. I remember back when I did my training, a lot of, you know, most people thought I was uh, crazy, if you will, but there were two places in the world where you could learn how to do these. You could either work with Brice Gaillet in Paris, France, at Institut Mutualis Monsori, which incidentally is the place where the first published case of a laparoscopic cholecystectomy came from. It's a, it's a very nice hospital in South Paris. And the other place where you could learn to do these procedures was in India with uh, 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 Dr. Pala uh, I chose I chose Paris. Um, then I went back to work at Columbia Presbyterian Hospital as an attending. I went to Fox Chase Cancer Center as the director of minimally invasive HBB surgery. Uh, then I went to private practice for a few years. Uh, we were affiliated with MD Anderson. That was in uh, next to New York City in northern New Jersey. And then I really realized that... Uh, so important to be politically correct these days. I'll just say that I, I realized that wasn't exactly what I was looking for. Um, and I moved to Paris. And I moved to Paris at the end of 2018. Um, and I, uh, I, I redid my exams. I had to learn French. I had to pass an exam to become a, a licensed surgeon here where only 10% of people passed the exam. So that was, uh, that was interesting. And um, once you pass the exam in France, you have to work in a public hospital for, for two years, which I've completed. And uh, I actually, I, you know, it's kind of interesting so people understand, I've actually accumulated 13 weeks of vacation. So this is actually my last weekend of call. My contract ends um, at the end of June. So I have a few months off. Another interesting thing about France is uh, even though I have the next two months off, I technically can't work anywhere. Um, I have to take my vacation, which is uh, kind of an interesting uh, 
change of, of uh, uh, lifestyle, if you will, from the United States. In the United States, you could always work. In, in France, you're kind of, uh, you're hindered, which is, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of reasons why I like uh, working in here, that there's a nice uh, work-life balance. But, uh, but my next plans are to go to the American Hospital of Tbilisi in the Republic of Georgia. So, so people get confused when I tell them that, no, I'm not moving to the state of Georgia in the United States. I'm moving, I'm, I'm gonna work this summer in the Republic of Georgia. Uh, at an American hospital there. It's actually um, funded by the DFC, which, which you know more about than I do. That's this is a big thing about it. I don't think a lot of people know what the DMC is, and I think it's an interesting world. So, I mean, it's uh, the Department of Financial, and I'm not even sure what the C stands for. It's All I know is it's funded by the American government about 80%. Yes, um, it is. Yeah, and they're actually opening up other hospitals in the region. So uh, they're hoping to have places where they can send, you know, I, I believe people in the area who work for the government so that they can, they don't have to travel so far for care. Uh, it's, actually almost a humanitarian, it's almost a humanitarian effort by the American government. A exactly. You, as you, you know, so um, I'm, I'm learning more about it. I'm, I've been there many times, but I haven't started actually working there. But I'm trying to build up um, the artificial intelligence. Uh, that is utilized over there. They already have some. They already use some artificial intelligence looking at endoscopy images, but I want to build up more and uh, build up some uh, some of their robotics over there. So it's uh, it's exciting because the DFC, and I hope I'm saying that correctly, is opening up multiple hospitals. And our and our hope is, you know, my hope at least is to to staff those hospitals with uh, doctors that I know in Europe. And, and I want to create a link with the American hospital in Paris. Um, so I'm still waiting for my French license to actually come through because of uh, all these things I've been telling you about. The, my two years are up at the end of, the, at the end of uh, June, but then there's a commission and I have to wait. One thing I've learned in France is to become very, very patient, but uh, it's, uh, it's, an exciting, it's an exciting time for me. I've, uh, I've traveled so much. Uh, in my time being in France, I've I've been, you know, I've I've I got to visit places like uh, Egypt many many times. I've created created great relationships uh, over there. Um, you know, as I said, I've been to Georgia many many times. So, and and Andrew, I think you've also worked for Medicines Sans Frontier. Is that correct? Yes, yes. Uh, that was back in two thousand and six. Before I did my minimally invasive HPV fellowship in Paris, I I spent about five or six weeks in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. I was actually there during the first democratic elections in 42 years. So that was um, intense. I was actually, I flew into Rwanda and then I took, a, I think about a three or four hour uh, Jeep ride, of course, you know, the famous white Jeep of uh, MSF. I went through Goma and I, I ended up in Ruchuru at a, at a rape center uh, is actually the, unfortunately the kind of the the title of the place because there's a lot of militia groups and there's a lot of problems with um with that yes okay i think we should we, we should actually discuss more about your work as editor-in-chief of um, artificial intelligence surgery if you wouldn't mind elaborating on because i think you were actually the person who started this whole thing yeah yeah so you know, one of the nice things about moving to France is I actually had more time to go back and do research. And that, that's kind of what I was alluding to uh, before. I found out that pure private practice um, is really not interesting to me. It gets very, very routine. And um, I, I really missed innovating or writing, presenting, and thinking about solving problems and not just thinking about uh, you know, numbers on, on a Excel spreadsheet, if you will, that's, uh, I'll leave it at that. So I started writing again and I, and I had the time to actually review all of my time over the last 10 years, essentially, uh, since I was a surgeon, I never had a chance to look back and look at my results. And, and some journals started to notice me, asked me if I wanted to start uh, being a guest editor for some special editions. And then finally, a journal asked me uh, one day after I guess edited one of their issues, would you like to be the editor in chief of a new journal that we want to call intelligent, uh, intelligent surgery? You know, I thought about it and, and I came back to them. I'm like, well, 
what if we call it artificial intelligence surgery? And I remember this was back in, my goodness, was it 2020 or, or 2019? I can't even remember now, probably 2020. And, and I remember thinking, I asked some of my, my other colleagues and my friends in, in surgery, like, are we crazy calling it artificial intelligence surgery? Anyway, we decided to do it. The, the journal agreed and we launched it. And as you know, um, what I once thought was crazy, now, now I think it was crazy that we didn't call it artificial intelligence surgery. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So it's, uh, we're now, this is technically our third year we've published, my goodness, I forgot how many editions now, so I'm not going to give you a number, but we basically publish every three months and, um, we're hoping to apply for an impact factor next December. So we've right. almost been, we've been up and running for almost a year and a half of, of, of publishing. So it takes two years before you can uh, request a formal uh, impact factor and be and be uh, present on PubMed, but I've been shocked at the interest. I've been shocked at uh, the amount of uh, articles that get sent our way. Um, it's really a fascinating, and uh, the, I love the field. I actually went and back. I did a master's uh, at a university in Spain in artificial intelligence, and I'm planning on doing a PhD uh, starting hopefully this summer in artificial intelligence surgery at the University of Magdeburg, which incidentally, I'm a uh, adjunct professor. Uh, my friend, Professor Roland Kroner, um, actually got quite a large grant from the German government. They wanna create a technology center at Magdeburg, which is about one hour west of Berlin. Uh, very uh, interesting. It's very interesting to me uh, personally as someone, um, I, you know, as a, from a mixed race background from America, it's very interesting to me that I became a professor uh, faster in the former uh, East Germany, if you will. And I'm also a professor, I'm a full professor of surgery in the Republic of Georgia. So right. I became a professor faster in the former Soviet Union than I did in my own country. So, you know, I'll leave that for the, for the <laughs> viewer to interpret. <laughs> indeed, indeed, indeed. So you, I know that you've, you've with, with, with this interest that you have in artificial intelligence, augmented intelligence in surgery and robotics, you've actually, you're about, you, you mentioned much earlier in the conversation that you were going to bring robotics to Georgia. How do you intend to do that? Yeah, so that's, that's a great question because comp larger companies like Da Vinci and probably CMR aren't equipped or they've decided not to go to Georgia as of yet, because I don't think, you know, it's, it's a, you need a huge infrastructure for repairs and for parts and everything. Really? So that they don't want to go to Georgia right now, probably for multiple reasons, which we won't get into here. Um, but what I want to do and something that in, interests me and is near and dear to my heart is handheld robotics, because we've been using robotics for many, many years. What I found was that surgeons don't really understand the subtleties of what robotic surgery is, what telemanipulation is. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we wanted to do our journal. You know, we actually did a white paper on autonomous actions and there's actually uh, six levels of autonomous actions. And it's based on the autonomous action, uh, autonomously driving cars. For instance, level zero is no uh, autonomy. Level one is telemanipulation, like the Da Vinci robot. It's a very low level of autonomy. So, you know, the Da Vinci is essentially remote control, right? Mm -hmm. You know, robo, a robot, comes from a Slavic word, which means, you know, you could interpret it as a meaning a slave, right? Mm -hmm. So it's an old word. You know, we should probably change robotics, but that's another discussion also. But I always tell people, you know, the, the Da Vinci robot isn't the slave. The surgeon is still the slave. So what interests me the most, actually, is autonomous actions when the robot can actually do something for us. We're, we're doing everything when we use a Da Vinci. But what interests me are things like, um, like the automatic stapler from Signia. You know, it, it has a sensor. It does an, a gastrointestinal anastomosis, which is part of a surgical procedure. And when the tissue is too thick, it won't fire or it'll slow down. And if the tissue is not thick enough, it won't fire. There's an element of interpretation that the machine does by itself that assists us in having fewer complications and doing our procedures better and safer. So that example I just gave you is actually an example of level two autonomy, right? Because the, the robot is actually doing something, uh, doing part of the operation for us. Yes. Now, uh, the ligature device, you know, the ligature, which is a vessel sealing device, 
it looks at 434,000 data points per second. And the algorithms tell you when, it's, when the vessel is sealed and when it's safe to cut the vessel. You know, that is another example of, uh, of level two uh, autonomy. That's another example of artificial intelligence surgery. So I use the term interchangeably. Artificial intelligence surgery is when you use artificial intelligence actually in the operating room. Artificial intelligence in surgery is when you use, you know, classically what the other medical fields think of as artificial intelligence, machine learning interpretation of radiologic images like radiomics or or the discovery of post-operative complications. That's artificial intelligence in surgery. But artificial intelligence surgery is what helps us as surgeons in the operating room to do safer operations, uh, more complex operations. So when I talk about the Da Vinci, I actually think for the Da Vinci robot to me is, of course, it's a beautiful device. But what interests me the most about the Da Vinci is the table created by Trumpf. You know, it moves the, uh, the robotic arms move whenever you change the angle of the table, whenever you put the patient in Trendelenburg or reverse Trendelenburg position or, or you airplane it left and right, the robotic arms will move with you autonomously. So yes. that's another example of uh, autonomous surgery. And that is the most interesting part of Da Vinci for me personally, you know, as an example. And, and I, I, should tell, I should tell you, and I, I don't remember if I did, but people... When I talk about surgery, I, I consider surgery, open surgery, laparoscopic surgery, you know, quote unquote, robotic assisted surgery with something like Da Vinci or CMR, that's surgery that people think classically, but you also have interventional endoscopy, that's part of surgery and interventional radiology. So all of these things are surgery nowadays. And there's many services, especially here in France, where the surgeons do all three, they do endoscopy, they do interventional radiology and they do surgery. And that for me is really the, the future of surgery. So I'm telling you all of this because people always ask me, okay, you give us an example of, of level two autonomy. You know, we're never gonna get to level four or level five. People always get confused, like where the robot does everything. Uh, like this is never possible. This is crazy. We don't want this. And I always have to remind people that we already have things like uh, AICDs, right? Yeah. Um, automated implantable or uh, cardioverter defibrillators. Yeah, you know, it, it'll diagnose, it's in the patient. There's no human involvement anymore once it's in the patient. It'll diagnose a malignant arrhythmia and it'll give a life-saving treatment um, autonomously, completely. That's a beautiful example of level five autonomy that already exists and has been around for over a decade. So yeah. artificial intelligence and autonomous actions are here. It's just that uh, we didn't know the vocabulary. Absolutely, and I think it's 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 very interesting. The because uh, I think we live in a moment in history where the present actually happened in the past, and that yeah. means that the technology is there. It's been there for the building blocks have been there for so long. The patents are now there. They're accelerating. I think the change is accelerating at such a rate yeah. that we barely notice, and then all that we notice when it's now in the past. And I think when you look at augmented intelligence and artificial intelligence in surgery, you know, we think that an advance is when we can detect the amount of pressure being exerted on an organ. And we can detect what the organ is and how and the shape of the organ. But I think that I do believe and it's just a it's a it's a faith I have in, 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 in the rate of change that machines, robots, as we like to call them at this point in time, I think they'll be called something else further down the track will actually be performing a certain amount of the surgery by itself. Absolutely. I mean, they already are. You know, when you look at surgery, you can break up surgery into surgenes, which is like part of a surgery, say a gastrointestinal anastomosis. But then you have an even smaller part of the surgery is, is, is a dexine, right? So it's maybe you, you make the holes in the intestine. That's one, that's a dexine. You put the stapler in and you fire it. You make the anastomosis. That's another dexine. And then you close the hole that it remains. That's the third dexine. All three dexines makes a surgene. Absolutely. So we already have an autonomous uh, dexine that is done all the time, this auto autonomous stapler. And I, I believe um, Ethicon actually has a circular stapler that is, you know, that is powered, but with a sensor. You know, there are other staplers that just, you hit a button and it just fires. Come hell or, hell or high water, whatever the expression is, it'll fire. Like if there's a nasogastric tube there, it'll fire. It's, it's, uh, that's, uh, that's automatic. It, you know, people need to understand the difference between automatic and autonomous. 
automatic is just you just hit a button and it just goes we're not interested in that we're interested in autonomy where there's a sensor where there's some interpretation by the machine that that is being done and i just wanted to correct uh, before I, I misspoke the ligature i said was level two i actually use the ligature as an example of level three autonomy because the ligature has three different buttons depending on how big you think the vessel is you choose which button you want so that's an example of level three and just for completeness sake uh, I use as, as an example of level four autonomy is something like when, when the interventional cardiologist, who I consider as a surgeon, puts up the catheter into the heart and the machine will actually detect areas of, of arrhythmias and will autonomously, while the cardiologist kind of just, they've done their work, they put, put it in the heart, will just sit there while the machine will go and ablate those areas of the heart by itself. So we have all examples of, of, of uh, you know, no autonomy, all the way up to full autonomy already. Yeah, it's a matter of time, isn't it? It really is. And I think that the, the, the comp companies like CMR, Da Vinci, um, I know Medtronic's coming out with their robot in Europe very soon, and all of these companies will, in time, be able to consume a lot of this AI and a lot of this that, that, that's been sitting there for years. In, well, you, you bring up a great point because another thing that we write about, we're actually, we wrote a white paper also on, on on ethics of AI, which Professor Gaius Bulverato from Padova is, uh, it's really her brainchild, uh, hopefully get published soon. But we talk about, we're really creating, um, unfortunately, if we're not careful, healthcare, you know, two different types of healthcare, you know, the haves and the have nots. And there's a danger that AI can exacerbate this greatly. And a perfect example is Georgia. The American hospital has the money and they want the Da Vinci robot, they want the CMR, but they can't get it. So this is why I was talking earlier about handheld robotics. I'm talking about more affordable robotics where the surgeon is in contact with the patient. I also use the term non-console robotics where the surgeon is at the bedside. They're not at a console some, somewhere. You know, if, if something happens when you're doing a Da Vinci or a CMR, the surgeon's not sterile. They gotta, they gotta get sterile. They gotta move the robot. They've gotta go in through a traditional incision. So, you know, what about a different way of doing this that actually, as you said, we've been doing, you know, this is how we initially did robotics with, with the ASOP, right? The ASOP is a, just a remote controlled camera holder that we had back in the 90s. You know, what about going back to that? And, and that's what I do. I, I use a, a Viki, uh, which is made by, well, it used to be made by Endocontrol. I think there's actually a new company that would purchase it. And I don't know the name of them, uh, but I, I believe it might still be Endocontrol. But an autoclavable little robot that holds the camera that enables me to you know, be in contact with my patient. So I have a little bit of robotics. I have the stapler I was telling you about. I have the ligature I was telling you about. And they're, they're articulating instruments. You know, There's one made by Handex uh, from a, it's a company in Israel that has eight degrees of freedom, I believe, which is one degree of freedom more than da, da Vinci. And now I have my robotics in my hand and I have haptics because I can feel when I'm about to tear tissue or destroy it, which is something you can't do when you're currently, when you're at a, a console, right? So um, CMR actually has some form of haptics, but the problem with that, the problem with that is the robot detects the resting tremor, tremor that we all have. And it kind of, uh, it makes the haptics not usable because it's, there's too much of a tremor. So yes. the, this is another beautiful thing about handheld robotics. You know, number one, we can maintain haptics. And, and number two, more doctors have access to this type of technology, get used to more autonomous actions. And, you know, we wonder if this is actually the safest way forward. Okay, that's interesting. I just want to say um, sure. uh, thank you very much, Andrew, for your time today. It's been fabulous to talk to you. And I look forward to talking to you when you've taken up your position um, in, in um, Tbilisi. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>